Steve Judd. My name is Sue Brain, and even though I've been a student of astrology for years, there's quite a few themes that I continue to be curious about. So I've turned to Steve Judd to help me deepen my understanding of them in this series of six 20-minute videos. For me, Steve is the perfect and obvious person to ask because he's been bringing astrology to the world for the past 40 years. The themes for all six videos are featured on Steve's website, that's stevejudd.co, and also his other website, which is astrobabbleproductions.com. So do take a look. But before we start, these videos are not aimed at the total beginner. However, Steve and I both believe you'll get a lot from them, irrespective of where you are on your astrological journey. So let's get going. Steve, I just want to start this series of video asking you about how do you interpret the human condition as an astrologer? I knew you were going to ask me this. <laughs> so I thought, well, what actually is the human condition? How do I define the human condition? And I found myself coming up with an instant answer. Um, I'm of that generation that grew up between the hippies and the punks. So I don't have heroes. But one of the heroes I don't have is a guy called Terence McKenna, mm. who's one of the greatest anthropologists of all time. I have most of his writings and videos. And he very succinctly pointed out that human, well, to quote Terence McKenna, human history represents such a radical break to any systems of biological organization that have existed on planet Earth before human existence but it's so different to anything else that it must be the response to some type of attractor or dwell point or magnet that lies ahead in the temporal dimensions. We're being pulled forward in a, in a rush to evolve. And that makes us very different because as a species, no other species, as far as I'm aware, has the capacity for self-reflective consciousness or for wit or humour or to be able to recognise oneself in mirrors. I mean, yes, dolphins have humour and cats, cats are weird anyway, cats can smile. Um, but as a species, human, the human is different to anything that's ever existed before on this planet. So when I think of the human condition, I find it, I always break it down using astrological hardcore concepts it's easy to fall into the as above, so below, or the microcosm reflects the, mic the macrocosm. But basically, I think it brings it down to fatal free will. And there's a lot of people, the majority of people out there, seem to be under the impression that their lives are routine and dictated by the society that they live in. And there's no criticism of this. Others, the curious ones, are the ones who look for a deeper meaning mm. um, and, and a deeper relationship with the planet, with their own spirituality, their own psychology and with the cosmos. And um, these are the people to whom the evolution and the acceleration of evolution becomes more and more of an imperative as they age. Mm. So when I think of the human condition, I think of this natural urge to progress and develop, which in most people is based around, I've got to make more money, I've got to have a good family and a good home. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's all based around structure, boundaries, borders, and the world as they've been led to believe it is. Whereas a significant minority of population 
don't have those values. They go beyond that. They, they look beyond for a deeper, more personal meaning. Bringing it down to this astrological chart then, how does, for you, how does the human condition show up in the chart? Well, that's a really good way. It's a really good answer to that because I've been dealing with this recently. Um, when I'm working with clients who are actively interested in their horoscopes and their lives and want to use astrology as a tool to improve their lives, then you will see that the results they get from this are pretty, pretty spectacular and they can move forward and mm. they do move forward. When you see people who have no interest in astrology, who don't know their horoscope, but I have their birth data and I can see their horoscope and I can see the same things happening in, this, in their chart to them as they are as do in the interested people's charts, then similar developments will happen to the people who are uninterested, but to a much lesser degree. Mm. So those who are interested and curious and proactive do get much better results than those who do not, who are not interested. Well, what, how it's still an influence, but nowhere near as strong. It, it, how would you see that? How would you be able to tell that somebody's really connected into understanding what the human condition is about? And how do you see that in a chart? I don't. <laughs> because I could, I could show you horoscopes of identical twins mm. with exactly the same horoscope one who will go oh, i really want to learn about astrology and one who will go oh, you don't believe that old rubbish do you mm. i could do it with a cup i've got celebrity charts who were born same day same year same hour same hospital who one will go one way one will go another mm. um because there is this it comes from within you've got to want to learn about yourself and many people are just saying okay where's the next meal coming from what's on telly tonight what's my football team doing how can I pay my mortgage and to them that is the be all and end all of life mm. I, I suppose another much more flippant but also succinct way of defining it is to talk about the difference between human beings and humans being mm. And I'm a human's being because I'm conscious and aware of my life. And uh, I can see the evolutionary growth when I look back over the path of my life, as can 99%, 95% of my clients and friends. Mm. Okay, so I really, I, I get, I really understand that this is an inner journey that we're talking about the human or connecting with the human condition or whatever that means to us. So uh, as an astrologer, um, the one thing that I would love to have some clarity around is, does it make a difference how you respond to life when you have a different element and node for your sun sign, moon sign and rising sign? For example, perhaps you have Sag sun, which is, you know, mutable fire. Maybe you have a Scorpio moon, which is a fixed water sign. Maybe, maybe you have Libra ascendant, which is cardinal air. How does that play out in somebody's life when it's so different? They're so they're so set. They're such separate elements and modes. Okay, bear in mind that I operate in a different way to most astrologers. Um, in that most astrologers will will react to a chart. I don't do that. I I I have a chosen way of working um, where I choose to see people as volunteering to come to planet earth on a mission statement for their own personal growth and to aid the planet in its long-term evolution and therefore the horoscope is a blueprint of their potential so when i see a horoscope where there's a large number of planets in a very small area or just in two or three signs or just in one element or mode 
Then I will look at this chart and go, okay, this person is a mission specialist. This person is here for a chosen particular skill, and they're going to influence a lot of others in that particular area. But when I see a horoscope where it is spread out in many different signs, modes, elements, I realize that this is someone who's here to learn many different things in a, in a short space of time. A less esoteric way of answering that would be to say that um, if you have something like a fixed moon, a, a mutable sun, a cardinal ascendant, you can be sure that the aspects to them are going to define which one is strongest. To me, the placing of the planets in the signs and the houses is not as significant or meaningful as the aspects. To me, the aspects in a horoscope are the, the core. I liken this to a cake in that the planets are the ingredients of the cake and the aspects show how they intermingle and mix and they actually become the body of the cake. Whereas the signs of the zodiac are the casing that holds the cake in, the outer crust, the marzipan, the icing, and the houses are the packaging. It's the, it's the plastic, it's the cardboard around the cake, the way it's presented into the outside world. But it is the aspects, the interactions, the dynamic interactions between planets that show individual facets of human behavior mm. that are the core to mm. me. Mm. I know so some, some, some points in the horoscope will be very strongly aspected and others will not. We're going to do a, a, a particular um, video on the aspects. So, but this is a great introduction to that. Um, so, okay, so I, I'm, I've, that's really helped me understand that somebody that comes in with a lot of different, um, let's say, different um, uh, um, um, ascendant moon and, for example, for, and, and the sun, um, they are probably going to come in to have um, a broader relationship with life than somebody that's got just a very um, uh, detailed part of the chart highlighted. Mm. Or let's say their moon, their sun and their ascendant is all either water or or, or cardinal or whatever it is. I, that's really helpful for me. OK, so next question is, do certain houses illustrate the human condition more than others? No. I'll expand on that answer. <laughs> um, 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 <laughs> individual houses expand on certain facets of the human condition. Each house is as pertinent as each other. Obviously, in any horoscope, there will be some houses where there are no planets in. And I suggest that one of the translations of this is that in this lifetime, and that person doesn't have to learn any direct input from that house's lessons to, to continue on their soul growth. Mm. But um, each house is as relevant as, as each other in terms of the lessons to be learned, because all 12 houses have distinct and succinct meanings and they're all as relevant as each other. So there is no stronger or weaker houses, unless of course you're in a situation where someone's born with six planets in the eighth house and nothing in the first, second and third. And then you've got a, a much more of a specialist. Mm. But um, again, that depends on the individual nature of the chart. Yes, that's that's I, I I see that now. And do you feel like that the eighth, a very heavy eighth house then is very indicative of somebody who is going to maybe specialize in the in the deeper relationship with life? Anybody with lots of planets in the eighth house is going to be naturally forensic and probably quite deeply psychologically orientated and very cautious about revealing themselves. Um cautious not secretive yeah and um um and they're going to be very good at working out what's going on behind the scenes because that's the nature of the eighth house yes because it is about what's below the surface isn't it that's the whole thing yes the hidden the the occulted yes but the human condition is so 
I mean, it's all about life, death, and sex, or and money, yeah. obviously, and that's and all action, very taxes. yeah, yeah, and, that, and that's really eighth house stuff. And uh, I know it's it's quite a, a sort of an, it's got a reputation of being an enigmatic house, and I've always. I've always been very curious about it and I can't learn enough about it to sort of deepen my understanding of what it means actually in my own chart, let alone in anybody else's chart. So that's really helpful that. It's... But isn't there a paradox there, Sue? Because the, the eighth house and the twelfth house and to a lesser extent, the fourth house, the water houses by, by their very nature are unfathomable. Yes. They are so deep. You can never understand them. You can know them, you can feel, sense, and intuit, but you can't understand because they don't work with logic. There is no understanding. It is it is yes. more of a sense and a knowing. Yes, that that, that makes so so much sense. Irrespective of whatever astrological sign is is ruling the eight as well. That's just a way they that that's how they express it. Mm. Okay, mm. final question for this particular video. I just sort of, people can be incredibly complex personalities. We all, I think. Mm. Um, and I, 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 I wanted to take two famous, well, t infamous tyrants, if you like, as an example, which I just found fascinating. For example, it's said that Hitler... Hitler's hobby was to whistle, and what he loved to do was to entertain his guests by whistling when you wish upon a star. That, for me, was utterly bizarre for this tyrant to have this weird hobby. And then Mussolini, another tyrant, wrote a bodice-ripping novel called The Cardinal's Mistress. Now, how does the chart help us to see such diverse psychology in a person? I've explored both these okay. charts. Oh, okay. I've got both of these charts in my database. So, um, firstly, muscle, uh, where is he? Hitler. Yes. Hitler had um, the exact opposition of the moon in Capricorn to Chiron in Cancer, whereas Mussolini had the Moon and Saturn and Ceres, the asteroid of the Mother, and Pluto, or conjunct Chiron. Both of these people, I suggest, were quite damaged in their early lives by their relationship with their mother. Um, that's just a core principle here. But when it comes to, first of all, with Hitler and his whistling, I draw your attention to the fact that Hitler was born... Where are we? Uh, there he is. Hitler was born. He was born... What, um, four months after Harpo Marx, four days after Charlie Chaplin, who played Hitler, um, a few months, six, eight months before Stan Laurel of Laurel and Hardy. And these people like Harpo Marx, Charlie Chaplin, Stan Laurel, they all had rather unique ways of communication. They were all... None of them were creatures of logic. They were comedians, mime artists. And uh, Hitler was born in the middle of this year-long group of people who had this um, configuration. And this was the Neptune-Pluto conjunction at the start of Gemini in the 1880, late 1880s, early 1890s. And I feel that his whistling was... Um, similar to Harpo Marx or Charlie Chaplin or Stan Laurel, a way of trying to communicate in a way that expressed his individuality without conforming. Because he was a, if you look at Hitler's chart, Taurus with Capricorn Moon, Libra Rising, he was very much, he wanted structure and order in his life, very strong Saturn in his 10th house. Um, but he needed to find a way of expressing himself that was different. And I think the the Saturn, the Uranus, the Neptune Pluto conjunction in Gemini gave him, in the eighth house, incidentally, gave him a, a, a way of expressing himself. I'm sure that he felt a great deal of comfort through that whistling. Mm, mm. Whether, whether the people who listened to him did or not, 
<laughs> but what, what, what I mean, what, this is for another video, obviously. But what we're talking about is um, a, a soul group, aren't we? The yes of 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 a soul group yes. expressing Whereas... itself individually, and he did it that way, and Harpo Marx did it that the way, and Chaplin did it another way. But they, yes. uh, I understand. Uh, I mean, I think I think it's fascinating that Chaplin was born only three and a half days before Hitler. Yeah. And Chaplin played Hitler in the movies. Yeah. So, um, but with Mussolini, everything in Mussolini's horoscope is in the top half of his chart. So he's much, much more of an extrovert than Hitler is. But Mussolini has one, two, three, four, five, six planets, all within 12 degrees, all in the same sign of Gemini, all in the same house, the seventh house. So with all that Gemini energy in his chart, he, he his mind was constantly active. And because it was in the seventh house, it was directed towards his one-to-one -one interactions with other, whether that was personal and intimate friends, social, professional, or family, doesn't matter, but one-to-one -one situations. And he and, uh, communicated. He, yes, he needed he to find a way of expressing himself in a literal communicative way that pertains to one-to-one -to -one situations and because he was essentially a fascist and he was he's, he's fairly obvious from his chart where again there's, there's a lot of stuff around his mother but he was brought up in an environment where he was from a very early age constructed or uh, indoctrinated to become a person of power over mm -hmm. instead of power in or power with that he needed to have control over his environment. Therefore, I suggest that his, his bodice-ripping books were uh, um, a reflection of his own desire to have power over women. Yes. That mis completely... Misogyny is essentially a fascist thing. It completely makes sense. Steve, we're drawing to, gosh, there's so much to, this is why I'm so glad we've got six videos to discuss this. this at least. One, at least, wonderful. I mean, it, it, just talking to you, it's just, you know, the, 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 the human condition is just so yummy and complex and deep and wow, isn't it? And, and astrology can at least enable us to, uh, to dip into it and explore it like this. So, Steve, thank That's you. the beauty of astrology. So it gives us uh, an objective, detached, and impersonal viewpoint on a on a on a on a, on a from a perspective which might otherwise get caught up in feeling, emotion, thoughts, intellect. But astrology can be objective, yeah. and that's 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 what makes it so unique. Yes, beautiful. So everyone, our next video is going to Steve's going to help us to recognize how we can work with our blind spots a little bit better. So, Steve, thank you. Gosh, I feel really full up now and, and inspired to, to, to go and study even more um, astrology and looking at the human condition in a different way. So we'll see you next time. And um, yes, well, bye for now. And uh, see, you, see you soon, Steve. Take next time. Bye. bye.